The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Many people are going to go through such a time that they're going to give up on their previous ways. You're going to see long-held traditions die. You're going to see the momentum behind the following of so many earthly figures die. You're going to see it. You're going to see some upset people because they're not going to get what they want. You're going to get the opposite. You will see the empowerment of the Middle East and the dethroning of everything else. And I do desire and pray that you guys are ready for that so that when you're unmovable, when your joy is still planted with good roots, that all those who may be shaken around you may look at you and see representation of Christ because their world, their way of life is going to be deeply upset and it will happen on every level, every level. Every outcome desired for is not going to take place. This is the beginning of the shakeup of shakeups. By the time it's done, only those things which cannot be shaken will remain. And I pray you guys are those folks. In the commercial world, right, the secular world, there's a lot of fallout. Things are not going right in the secular world. We know what that is. We're reading about that revelation. It is the rise of something nothing will halt. Nothing will stop. As it rises, so will the Lord empower his vessels with the real Holy Spirit. No one need to fake it. All you have to do is be rooted in truth in your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'll tell you something. The deeper the roots are in Christ, the less you have to say about anybody else. Do you know that? When you have shallow roots, you have everything to say about everybody else. When you have deep roots, you have nothing to say about anybody else. I know this firsthand. When I was a young Christian, I had thoughts on everybody. I would always point at somebody and say, well, they're the reason for this, and that's the reason for this. And as my roots became deeper and deeper in Christ, when he becomes real, you realize something. The Lord is Lord of all, and he never lost control. When you find out there is a Lord, a king appointed over all life, all existence, then guess what? That's when you take your hands off. You say, well, the Lord's got that. I'm not poking my head in his business, right? When you're an employee of a company, you don't go to the president's office and start going through his drawers and try to find out what he's doing, do you? You don't do that. You'll get fired. It is disrespectful. We'll do that in the world, but we will not do that with the Lord, will we? As your roots get deeper and the Lord becomes very real, you realize he has everything in his hands. There is nothing that exists that is outside of his hands. That's when you become a non-critical person and you become mission-oriented, focused on the work of the Lord, focused on the people, focused on people rising, not how many people messed up. That's when you stop counting your losses and you count all of your blessings. That's when you have a real praise and no complaints. That's what happens. That's when that charged fire returns and it was not prompted. That's when it stays with you and it does not go away despite your condition, despite what's going on in your life. Nothing can put out that flame. And while everybody else is moping around, you have thoughts of praise, a heart of joy and sharing and caring. You go above and beyond in everything you do in life for the sake of the people. It's also when you see how precious and rare humanity is. That's when you really love them. Yes, the people out there doing all sorts of evil, you love them and you desire to join in with the gospel of Jesus Christ to do something about it. Not sit idly by, be a person on a porch and point and talk about everybody that walks by. You cease being a murmurer and a complainer and you labor in the fields. Remember what the Lord said, the harvest is ready but the laborers are few. Remember he said that the harvest is ready but the laborers are few. Why would the laborers be few? Because you have most people pointing out every fallacy of everybody else. Isn't that true? We did that. We were there. We were. But as you mature, as your roots get deeper, you become very thankful, very effective, relentless. You don't struggle with the devil anymore. He won't come near you. He knows he can't do anything against you. He already knows that. Why? Because at that point, you're following Christ as best as you can. And that's all that's required of you. It is required of no one to do what they cannot do. It is required of us to do all of what we can do. 
And if you do that, you're doing well. We can make that transition. See, that's an actual transition. That's a transition from what people are right now to what people desire to be. It's a transition from being a murmurer and a complainer to a person who walks around with consistent, constant praise within them, with great respect and joy in their hearts, with an unshakable peace and open eyes, ready to do what's necessary in true servitude of the Lord. That's a transition. Nobody could have told me I would have the resilience I have today a long time ago. You couldn't have told me that. Nobody could have told me that I would be talking about the Lord to a bunch of people in 2024. You couldn't have told me that in the 90s. You couldn't have told me that in 2002. You couldn't have told me that. And I love the Lord, but I was not going to talk to people. You know why? Because in my mind, people were, especially civilians, they were nothing but crybabies. That's what was in my head. All they do is cry and whine and complain. They have a daily complaint. That's what I used to think. I honestly used to think that. As a soldier, you don't have complaints. I didn't have complaints. You have gripes, not complaints. It's the difference. But civilians, they have it so good and complain about everything. They have such freedom and liberties and complain about everything. Taking advantage of every free moment they have. Turning a truly gifted day into a disastrous moment with their own doings. Sabotaging their own relationships. Allowing things to operate in their lives that disrupt others. I did. I thought they were complainers. I had nothing good to say about civilians. I cared about them. I fought for them. But I had nothing good to say about them. Because they were like a whining bunch of babies in my mind. Until the Lord woke me up. Until the Lord showed me who I really was. He showed me who I was not. See, when you first start out, you're in full adoption mode. You start looking for a mentor in the world. You begin to emulate who you respect the most, and that's what you become. I became a soldier in that regard, looking for the best of commanders, and okay, I'll take that tree. I'll do this. I'll do that. I compiled all that together and came up with a character. They called that character Rock. And yes, that was before the movie star had his name. And the only reason they had that name was because I was unmovable as far as my job, mission, so on and so forth. What they didn't know was I was ripped internally, full of conflict, suppressing everything. At times I was dissatisfied, depressed, all sorts of things, but you can never tell but they have a good poker face. So in essence, I was walking elusively in a character I created, but inside I was dying, non-fulfillment. I was a thrill seeker too, so I volunteered. For everything I could became everything I could try to get every patch I could get. Because I got bored with standard things. And the Lord stepped in. Even after helping people. Even after assembling COT. But nobody, it wasn't a COT that was online. It was actually working internationally. Getting people help they needed. Not for posterity. Not for anybody's thanks. And we did that because we realized... People were dying every single day. The number of us was small back then, and we started to grow. All that surrounded the idea that the world had forgotten or was extremely prejudiced against anybody who was not in their club. As we continued, I still saw civilians as crybabies, children as undisciplined, all sorts of things. Then the Lord had me look at myself. And the only reason that I was not a complainer was because I had a different way of complaining. A professional way, you could say. Everything I criticized, everybody else, I had become, I could see within myself. Then the Lord showed me the ultimate thing. For anything I could point out to anybody's life, anything, any civilian I pointed at, whether they be a rotten one, whether they be a good one, anything I pointed out, the Lord showed me that I dealt with that, that it was in my life. It's just that people could not see it. I was very good at hiding everything about myself. But the civilians were not. Even with the sin, the Lord showed me all of it was sin. There is no one sin that's greater than the other sin, which is more than the other sin. All of it is in the realm of darkness. All of it is in the realm of flesh. And so every time I would have a complaint about someone, the Lord would show me myself. Every single time. Then the ultimate thing happened. And I was somewhat separated from all people. And it was those moments, that time with the Lord, that made the biggest difference. The very people I complained about, I began to miss. You know how sometimes you see too much of a person, have too much of the same food, and you start complaining about it. Your body is designed to have somewhat of a variety. Many people can't even eat the same thing every day for years. They can't do that. 
they get a taste for something and they really want it. They don't want anything else that's being spoiled. The Lord showed me I was full. I was content. Only when you're full and content do you start picking and choosing for things. And I was incredibly full. I had control of my life, control of my career. Everything was going in my direction. And that's a fullness. That was a big mistake. Because when you make that mistake, now that sounds like the ultimate life, doesn't it? When you're in absolute control. When you control everything. When everything is perfect just the way you want it. Right? That sounds like a good way of life. No, that's called being dead. So let me show you how. By eating. A person who is starving, hungry, goes into a restaurant. They sit down. They say, what do you want to eat? And the guy says, anything. Pick anything so long as I can get it within about four or five minutes. As long as I eat, I'm good. Just anything. The waitress says, anything? Yes, anything. So they get the first dish, and the guy eats it, and he is incredibly thankful. Do you know why? Because he was starving. Another person walks in. They really just ate dinner two hours ago. They're not hungry, so they sit down, and it takes them four hours just to order food. They're complaining about everything, the service, the forks, the place, the restaurant, the people. They're complaining about everything. Why? Because they're full, because they don't need anything. That's why they complain, because they're full versus the guy that was starving. When you're full, you complain about everything because you don't need anything. When you're starving, you're appreciative over anything because you were starving. The Lord showed me I was full. He showed me a lot of people in the earth that are full. And then that's when he almost communicated. If you're full, you've got to learn to be hungry again. But how do you do that? How do you learn to be hungry again? He showed me. I shouldn't have asked. But he showed me. And ultimately, I became hungry. And when I was hungry, I was satisfied. And when I was satisfied, I truly had joy. I was truly appreciative. Not just a thank you, but a real embrace. Everything became real and authentic. Before I would shake somebody's hand and not remember whose face it was. Later on, when I shook their hand, I would think about them, look them right in the eye. Not saying too much, but praying the best for them. Discerning many things that were quite accurate about their lives, but holding it to myself. Why? So they could become fulfilled as I had become. That's a transition. When God takes us from being one person, and we think it's impossible to change from there, and everything is going downhill, yet He elevates you up to this incredibly high level by starvation. Now tell me that's not impossible. That's an impossible thing. That was one of probably a trillion, trillion ways the Lord can work in a person's life to get them to where they're supposed to be. All the saints are going to have a transition. And you will not be as you are today. As we said last time, though, it's your choice. Depends on how real you want everything to be. So I'm going to ask you something before we start tonight. I'm not ask. I want you guys to think about something. Think about something. You're dealing with the world, yes. One day, nothing of the world is going to be left. One day, this earth is going to be in shambles. And that's very soon. Riches will not be riches. Assets will not be assets. Security will not be security. All that will be taken away. Let me ask you something. Who will you be then? Who will you be in the absence of everything you control? Of every piece of comfort that you have? Who will you be when your refrigerator is empty? The windows in your house are blown out. Who will you be? Will you have an identity or will you be miserable? I saw a person yesterday and a storm hit their house and they cried for the house because the storm hit it. They said every memory and all the precious moments were connected to that house and that they were weeping for the house. Yes, it was sad to see that because somebody would actually be that way. But then the sentiment changed. People started saying, oh yes, I truly understand. They were weeping for a house, not for the children who were hurt in the storm but for the house. See, the children were hurt. The mother did not cry for the children. She cried for the house. Do you not know the same mindset permeates all throughout the world within too many people? They are defined by their stuff. I mean, hit a soft spot. You're defined by your animals. It was a person who lost two horses and they tried to commit suicide. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us. Do you see what has happened? In the course of our freedom, in the course of the liberties provided, People have corrupted themselves and have recreated themselves into this thing that is not what God describes. Their identity is in their wealth, whether that wealth be a house, and it doesn't matter what the condition is, whether it be a house, a bunch of pictures on the wall, 
Most people have their favorite thing. And if something were to happen, they would grab that favorite thing. Of all things in their house, they would have to save that one thing. I give you a challenge. Don't have one of those. That's the challenge. Don't have something you have to grab of any material thing. But listen to me. I want you to think of this. Make it where if something happens, you can walk out of your dwelling place with nothing. And your identity is intact. Your joy is intact. I have strange practices. I do. And do you know why? Because I fight the flesh every single day. I have no pictures. Do you guys know that? No pictures. You know how most people hang pictures up? I don't do that. I won't do it. I won't hang pictures. And the reason why I don't hang pictures, right, is because you keep a memory alive in a frame. Now, that seems harmless, doesn't it? It's very harmful, right? It's very harmful. It's harmful in this respect. I have to fight it. Now, if you can fight it and get over it, it does not hurt you or anything else, you're good. But to me, people are everything. They're extremely precious. And I already knew I would try and savor the moment by keeping that picture in the frame. And it would mean something to me. So I can allow myself to ever be like, like that. If somebody were to ask for my help and I had to abandon everything that I had right here, do you not know I could do it in a heartbeat without regrets? It would be a great inconvenience never to come back, yes. But it would not change who I am, nor my enthusiasm. It would not slow me down. See, I, I have this habit. I can't have something in my life that will slow me down in my true servitude for people. So I cannot feed the flesh. When you feed the flesh a sugar cube, see, you feed your flesh that sugar cube, you give into it. As soon as you eat it, you're going to want two more. Now, you thought when you ate that sugar cube, you would be satisfied. And it didn't work that way. You're satisfied for the moment. And then that desire to have another comes back into you. And you know what it does? When that desire comes back, your life starts to be reformulated so that you can have that sugar again. And then you're satisfied for the moment, shorter time this time, and it happens again. And so you're going to find yourself always having to have sugar. And until one day, you can't be who you really are without sugar. Because you know that if you don't have it, it will disrupt the course of your day. You're going to have to stop everything just to satisfy that craving for sugar. And only with a bunch of sugar at a specific time are you going to feel secure enough to go forward with your identity. Otherwise, you're going to have a great insecurity. You'll sit up one day with no sugar, worried where your next sugar cube is coming from. And in the meanwhile, you will not be able to love your neighbor to perform as you normally would perform. Why? You're going to be predominantly occupied with that strong desire and a massive worry of where the next sugar cube is coming from. This is what happens when you feed the flesh. So in just about every aspect of life, I work against that. You know how you get hungry? Everybody says, oh, yes, it's time to eat. I'm hungry. You know what I say? No, it isn't because I'm not eating right now. I have a tendency to direct this flesh, not give in to it. I will not feed it what it wants. It's going to carry out what I desire. Your flesh is like a used car. You will discard it one day. So while you're learning how to navigate, you're going to hit things all along the way. That's your body. But it will be discarded. Now, a driver does not live to drive the car, correct? Anybody who drives a car is driving that car to get them from point A to point B. If you're not careful, you will live to drive that car. And the car will dictate what you can or cannot do. The car will dictate everything about you in your life. Because you'll become a servant to the car. I am not a servant to the flesh. I can't become a servant to the flesh. I won't become a servant to the flesh. It is given that it will serve me as I seek to serve Christ. I don't even want this body in health unless it's going to serve Christ. You guys know that? Why would anybody ever have a prayer like that? Because I know, I know that if I was fully 100% but not serving the Lord, it would create a pathway I don't want to go down. Because I'm dusty and crusty and old and I already know that. I do not want to be in health if I am not going to serve the Lord. And so my prayer is strengthen me, Lord, as I seek to follow you. That's my prayer. Everything is conditional with my prayers. And I purposely state to the Lord, I do not want comfort, health, or anything else if I'm not going to use it to serve you. 
Because when I decided to be true to the Most High, I decided to be true to the Most High. Not halfway, all the way. That's pretty bold prayer, huh? If you think of it, not really. It's an honest prayer. I don't want to be empowered outside of the will of God because I will deviate the path. Any of us would. So if you found that out, if you found out you're no good, if you're empowered beyond a certain point, why would you even ask for it? Why would you pursue it if it's going to do nothing but take you away from the Lord? And do you know as a consequence of that what the Lord has done? He empowered me anyway. He added an empowerment to my following of him. And come to find out, he was looking for authenticity of my heart towards him. That's why in the Bible it says, at a specific point it says, if you seek first the kingdom of God and all of its righteousness, all these things that people ask for is going to be added to you. Why? Because your desires change. That's why. You're not the same anymore. You're not going to ask for the same things anymore. Once you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, your desires change. You're no longer serving flesh. Your identity is not bound to any tangible thing in the world, nor any ideology. Your identity is intact, given by God to you, and it is maintained that way. When that happens, that's when you can walk with strength. Now, in the time that we live in, with all the diversity of issues, how many people would lose their identity walking in a place full of disaster from your left into your right? Many would lose their identity. That's why it's good right now in this time of peace to make a choice for the Lord in a time of peace. To make the sacrifices now in a time of peace. Not when you have to, but when you don't have to. Make your decisions in a time when you don't have to really do anything. Follow the Lord intently when you're not forced. And when that time of pressure comes, you will not be pressured. You'll be like David when he fought Goliath. You will. While everybody else is hiding and ducking. And, and scared to death and they can't do anything. You will walk upright in full representation of the kingdom. I'm trying to tell all of you it's not in you to be normal like everybody else in the world. Do you know that? If you love the Lord, it is not in you to be normal, not like the world. It's in you to be royal, that your words have authority, not to use the world's science as a replacement Holy Ghost, not to use the internet as a spiritual gift, to find things out on people, but to actually know it. You know how many times I've seen somebody there when I'm talking, they're sitting there shaking their head, taking notes about something else. Isn't that funny? If I were to describe the scene, I doubt if that those people would speak up, but you, you just see so many true things with the Lord. Do you know that can be tried, proven, and tested, and everything else, and it will be accurate every single time. A lot of people don't believe that, because all they can believe is what they have been living. Your servitude of the Lord and the realness of the kingdom of God is not embedded in many folks because they're not walking that specific path. See, there's always a step of faith people are frightened to make. They're frightened to take that step. It's like a person getting saved. They get saved, yes. They love the Lord, yes. But they still do things, terrible things, and mess up big time. And they can't seem to get out of that circle until you tell them there's another step. Just as the disciples accepted Christ and witnessed his miracles and still had issues believing. So then that means if you were to perceive miracles all over the place, it does not guarantee you're going to believe a whole lot better. You're always going to have that voice that speaks against the spiritual things. It will rationalize everything. You can be that one who accepts those things of your father and then he begin to fill you up with a truth you can't explain. It would almost be like you open it. Say you open up your Bible. You're about to read something, right? But all of a sudden, it is as though you just read that chapter, but you didn't. Can you imagine flipping to a chapter, a random chapter in the Bible? In that chapter, you have this sensation that you just read the whole thing. I mean, that fresh in your mind, just like that, with a snap of a finger. Imagine talking to somebody. You're talking about something, and all of a sudden, the Lord gives you words formulated directly for that person, that they no longer fight you, but they receive what you're saying. Imagine that. That's called help. See, a lot of people try to, on their own, get people to hear them, and they always have the same complaint. Well, they won't listen to me. I'll tell you something. If the Lord talks through you, 
she already said something, that the Holy Spirit will give you words that nobody would be able to gainsay against. You know what that means? You'll be effective. In fact, you'll be speaking, and you will stand beside yourself, hearing yourself, being a student at the same time as you're a speaker. That's what the Lord has for you, a completeness. And when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, you grow. You'll be trusted more and more to know things. He'll bring you up to a person. And instead of you trying to guess who this person is, the Lord will show you everything about their lives. Even the bad stuff. But listen, if the Lord showed me when I'm talking to people, right? Before I would talk to people, I would get a sense about them. That was natural to me. But then one day I would talk to people and the Lord showed me some horrible things about people. Do you know what happened? I loved them even more. I saw how they were vulnerable. The worst the thing was the more love that came out of me towards them. It's like triage. They needed critical medical care above everybody else. The worse the problem, the higher the level of sin, the greater the priority they are. Do you know that? That's when you have spiritual eyes. When you catch people out there and they're sinning, they're all corrupted and messed up, they become the highest priority. When somebody thinks they're doing okay, they become low priority. That's for real. That's the truth. Remember when Jesus said he came? He didn't come for those who thought they were okay. He came for those who were not okay. You remember that? I've talked to some of you guys in COT by emailing. You guys have opened up. Some people have opened up about things. They don't even know why they opened up and they told some of the most horrible things. But for some reason, they knew they could trust writing COT, which is me, that email, because... I've learned that nobody ever surprised me, but it started a fight. And for some of those people, it took a year, but they have been victorious in Christ. The ones with the worst problems in COT, I'm talking about the worst problems, have become victorious in Christ, overcoming all things in their lives by Christ. This happened through emails, not through a voice call, through emails. Then you get one of those video emails where their family is excited and they're different people. That is the Lord's work, the real work, the true work. And it happens with people who are overwhelmed with sin. See, that's what we are to do in this world. Not to pick the best and go hang with the best. Leave all the sinners in that corner. What work is that? There's work to be done here on this earth. We require the Holy Spirit's instruction to, to do that work, to be sent in the right direction still a lot to be done and the Lord is by no means close to his performance limits in us. The Lord is so good and it was important for me to seek him on an authentic level, not some public level, not for the sake of posterity, not so I can impress this person or that person. Nope. I sought the Lord so that I could be effective in his established gospel and by doing that, he is the one that positioned me to be in certain places at specific times. To do this and to do that, to be in the know here, in the know here, not to be in the know in certain areas I don't want to be in the know in. He has protected me from day one. He has shielded me. Why? Because I choose to say yes to him. He didn't force me and nobody else did either because nobody knew what I was doing. And the Bible it says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. No one could obstruct what I was doing in the Lord because no one knew what I was doing. They only knew the outcome. Lord showed me a long time ago, people have good intentions. But unless they're walking completely by faith, they're going to always think that they have the best method for somebody else. And because of that, the Lord said, no, keep that one to yourself. Just continue, and in the right time, I will reveal if it's necessary. Lastly, I do nothing for reward. I don't want to be rewarded by people. I don't want someone to say, you're right, Mike. I don't. You guys who are old in COT, you found that out the hard way, didn't you? I remember the first time we saw, I started talking to COT and everybody said, I said something. Everybody said, hey, man, I totally agree. And I said, no, 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 not me. I'm not the one for that. Don't give me the praise. Give the Lord the praise. Because I would have nothing if it did not come from the source of truth. Now, if I tell you something that absolutely turns your life upside down and destroys it, that was from me. But if I tell you something that aligns with the word of God, you become victorious in the end. That was from your father through me. I'll tell you some folks, when the Lord, when he's chief of your life, when the Lord is chief of your life and somebody gives you the worst thing they ever did, suppose it was murder. See, 
the Lord desires to use all of us, but who is he going to send? In the Bible it says, whom shall I send? If you were talking to somebody for a year, and then in the last year, and say you knew them for two years, and they said, I have to tell you something. You guys had a good, close relationship. And they say, you know, right before we started talking, I murdered someone. Many of you would cut communication and say, oh, my Lord, I've been talking to the devil himself. No, you're talking to a person who was compromised, who was overtaken by darkness. People who murder and do these deeds, murder and adultery are one and the same. Hatred and murder are one and the same. Did you know that? Because the spirit of murder and the spirit of adultery, which actually is Jezebel, is the exact same thing. They're cousins. They're related. They live in the same house. You know that? Jealousy, human jealousy and adultery live in the same house. They're, they're, they're siblings. Somebody said, wow, he confessed that to you. Yes. And you know what? We took care of that legally. Do you know that? We did. We took care of that legally. The guy had no problem telling exactly what he did. Those steps were taken and everything was worked out. This person is on the fast track to recovery. This person has his joy back. This person is incarcerated and they have their joy back. I can't talk too much about it. Because, see, the world does not understand things like that. This person has their joy back. This person has their family back. This person has the respect of their children. And that relationship is being worked out. Why? Because they turned to the Lord and it only took some crazy person from the bushes to let that person know that the Lord was real, that the Lord cared about them. The Lord knows everything about them. And he still loves them. And that's why Christ died. See, somehow that's been lost in this day and age. Where people have it in their minds, oh no, Christ didn't die for that. He only died for this over here, what we can handle. No, no, that's not how things work. That's how flesh works. To pick and choose who can recover and who can't. That's an abomination for man to attempt to take control of the narrative of the gospel and give it to the people they like and refuse it to the people they don't like. That's an abomination. Christ died for all. All who would accept it, so long as they have life. They have an opportunity, and it is God the Father who gives them life each day. Without him, none of us would have life. Mankind has drifted far away from the gospel into something else foreign, something that's not the gospel, yet it's accepted as the gospel. The Lord said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. And do you know what this stuff that people believe in the world is leaving? Pain, misery, suffering broken relationships and i'm talking about those who were supposed to be christians how can a christian institution leave all the broken behind them they just rip up relationships like a like a weed eater a shredder and they keep going as though nothing is wrong and when it comes to the folks who really need christ they deny them do you all see that what is this spirit that jumped in people that's looking for only the perfect to join their perfect team they're ignoring the wounded and the wounded are in search of relief. Do you know that? Somehow, you got to get that right. I'm certainly not doing this for posterity. Fame and fortune, all that stuff. I'm not doing that for that. There are people out there that need Christ. But who's going to represent Christ in the true way that the Lord, he has already said. He already has the gospel. Who's going to represent what's already there? Why do so many keep changing the standards of our Lord? They want everything neat and tidy. And they're ignoring the wounded. Do you know, you know it's so funny? Most of you all, how many of you all belong to another organization, but it, did, it just wasn't working out there? And so you came to COT, and in COT, you found freedom. Did that happen to you? You tried it other places, and you found something you did not like. And all of you have a common story. But what you've got to be careful of is not to repeat what you saw but to seek the Lord with all of your heart to be authentic. Our deeds, our deeds as human beings, are trash. It is by way of Christ that we are restored only. Our deeds are trash. It is the Lord that is restoration for us by His blood. By His blood. When we seek the real Christ, we recognize very real issues. It is heartbreaking because the wounded are being kept out. That's why I like who I like. Do you know why? Because they have a heart for the wounded. It is very difficult for me when I see a person who does not have a heart for the wounded. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about the wounded. And there are people out there suffering. That's why you don't hear me criticizing people. You know why? Why would I criticize a person who's wounded? Many people 
get too complicated and they'll say well this is self-inflicted well isn't the sin we committed self-inflicted yes we did that every sin i ever committed is premeditated i knew exactly what i was choosing and i chose sin i didn't mistakenly sin i knew exactly what i was doing they do too a lot of them if i lied to a person it's no different than somebody else holding a family hostage all of it leads to one thing you know what that is? Death. I thank God for the times I've been in combat because it changed a lot in me. See, I know that the end result of arguments is war. And the end result of war is death. There's no victor in war. You don't win a war. There are only losses. War is nothing more than a continuation of politics by violent means. That's all it is. One person getting their way over another. The Lord is necessary. War is when men force their ideology upon another. In times of old, God directed wars. He may direct some now. That's his call. This is his creation. But when people argue, what does it end in? Carnage. Whether it be a divorce, broken families, it's carnage. Haven't you noticed I do not entertain arguments? I believe in the Father's real resolve. I believe in the Father's way. I believe in the blood of the Lamb. I believe in the Holy Ghost. Not like other people do. Other people try to own the information of the living God. I do not try to do that. I'm not the authority of his word. God is the authority of his word. But I do seek to find everybody that can be found who is trying out for a savior. But who will go to the folks who actually call for the living God? Half of you, you called out for the living God and no one came. And you went through a lifetime of struggle. That's why you struggle. You were meant to struggle. Your struggle was purpose. Do you know why? So that you would not deny somebody else the opportunity of having someone speak the true gospel to them. The greater your struggle is, the more authentic your presentation of Christ is going to be. Don't you know that? Don't you know that? All of you who struggle up to this very day, if you were to ever go by the love of your heart to represent Christ to somebody else, and the Lord brought to mind all of your struggles, and how many times nobody answered, Despite what you have done, you would bring nothing but the truth to those who call out for the living God. You would not bring your interpretation. You would bring to them the absolute truth. You would treat that situation with much care. Lord knows what he's doing. And you are not ordinary people. You're not the world. You were born like them, but you're called by the Messiah. You answer that call, and you seek to find him in full. Your life is not wasted. Your life is on the rise. This is your hour. It's also an hour of decline of the world. And it's time for us to get into position. An absolute representation of the Lord's truth. I want you guys to think of somebody in your close circle. It could be a friend, family member. Somebody who didn't quite treat you the best. But one day, you saw them in need. Possibly they hurt themselves. Something happened. And all of a sudden, you said within yourself, I'm going to help them. And you did that with real love. Think of that situation. How many of you have had a situation like that? Somebody you that didn't get along with you. Maybe you didn't like them. They didn't like you either. But then they got themselves in trouble. And all of a sudden, you said something rose up within you. You said, I'm going to help them. And in that moment, you didn't think about anything they ever did to you. You were so focused on helping them. You didn't see them as you saw them right before that situation. You were focused on helping them. If you've ever gone through that situation, do you remember when you focused on them and with your compassion and truth, nothing was going to stop you from helping them? You remember that? Guess what? You heard the voice of the Lord. That's your father's voice. That's how you know. The father always speaks in truth. It's full of strength and resolve. It is sure, never wavering. It is rooted in love and there is no flaw in it. Remember that. That's when you heard him. And can you remember how you responded? How purposed you were? How sure you were? And don't you remember? Everything else faded away. All the noise of life and everything faded away in that moment. Do you remember that? Now you know. So never forget that. By the way, he did speak through you. You may wonder sometimes how he operates in the earth. Now you know what you're here for. We were in Revelation 8. Well, we're kind of in Revelation 8 and Revelation 9. But Revelation 8. You guys following me? So, we talked about the 
first angel sounding. Silence in heaven about the space of an hour, but then that first trumpet as they began to blow the trumpets. Right, these trumpets. I want you guys to see this. When the trumpets blow, because I'm going to match this up with some something briefly. I'm not going to take up too much time. In Revelation 8, 4, and the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God under the angel's hand, and the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. The prayers of the saints ascended up before God under the angel's hand. The prayers of the saints. Who are the saints? Did you know you declared sanctified by the blood of the Lamb? Your prayers. Those true prayers. Not our routine ones. Thus they be grounded in the truth but your prayers why would the prayers of the saints right why would they be cast into the earth along with along with that consequence because if you notice look and the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake why would the prayers of the saints be in there do you guys remember in the fifth scene those who were slain for the word of god under the altar, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not avenge us of them that dwell upon the earth? They were killed for the testimony they held. For the word of God, God never forgot, right? God said, Vengeance is mine. We all know this. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And so guess what? Not that they prayed for vengeance. No. They prayed for his justice. They prayed for his goodness. They prayed for his mercy. And when they were slain for the word of God, after making that request unto the living God, these are martyrs, and they're slain for the word of God. Their prayers, their requests, never for God, but most of all, during the time of their demise, they held their status. Remember Stephen when he said, Lord, don't charge them with what they're doing. They were stoning him. And he said, Lord, don't put this, don't, don't charge them with this sin. That is a true prayer so rooted in truth and in love and in the consistency of our God, it is such that has wrought his vengeance upon the earth. Do you know that? The meek and the humble. The ones who will say, Lord, forgive them for what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. Forgive them. Don't charge this sin on them. Please forgive them. Those are the ones that have wrought the whole judgment of God upon the earth. Those are the ones. The ones like Stephen. The ones... They didn't fight back because their primary goal was to represent the kingdom. And they were working in love and by the blood of the Lamb. And when you do that, you're not fighting back. You're working. You are working and representing. See, it's not a weakness. A lot of people think it's a weakness not to fight back wrong. It takes a thousand times the strength of the average person to not do anything. And to still have a heart towards those who are taking your life. To have an understanding of the situation? Think about that. Stephen understood that they were over, overcome by darkness. Stephen understood that they could not hear the voice of the Lord, that they were overcome by all these statements and everything else that was whispering into their minds, and they acted on it. Stoning him, he knew exactly what was going on. He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He did. They were stoning him to death. And he said, lay not this sin to their charge. Even in his moment of demise, he wasn't fighting back, but he had a full understanding of what was happening. See, the world cannot interact like that. They can't. A heathen will always fight back. And those who are spiritual understand what's really happening. Stephen knew they were compromised. He knew exactly what was happening with him. When you are spiritually mature, you will see too. You'll always see what your adversary is actually doing, and you'll see people being utilized to carry out his work. So Stephen... And his obedience to the Father and walking in love allowed the Lord to operate through him. And he carried out the Lord's work. I can assure you that if a thousand people were out there stoning him, Stephen having a heart of compassion upon them while he was being stoned, overcame all the darkness in them eventually. That one person who stayed in the confines in that passage of love overcame the darkness in the thousands that were stoning him. Because he stayed within the Lord. When you step outside of the Lord, you do nothing but add complexity to darkness. In the human mind, your carnal mind, the first thought to hit you is don't let anybody do that to you. And that's of the flesh, not of your father. Stephen would have never been in that situation if God did not have him be born to be in that situation. Are you starting to get it? 
He started, how can a person ever go through something they're not born to go through? Somebody explain that to me. How can you go through anything in life that you're not born to go through? If you went through something you're not born to go through, you would be dead. You would not be here. You wouldn't. You're born to go through those things. The problem is we've heard the world's narrative and explanation and interpretation of all these scriptures, which is causing us not to be able to see the truth of the spirit, the, the real truth. If a person is a spiritual person, truly spiritual, they could care less what happens to their flesh. They're going to be focused upon the Lord's work, much like many of you just admitted that that person that didn't like you, when they got themselves in trouble, something rose up in you and you said you were going to help them. Despite what they did to you, you stepped out in love for them. Do you not know what that does to a person? When you step out in love to a person who has treated you like trash and garbage, and you're doing so at the prompting of the Most High, not your own prompting, but the prompting of the Most High. See, every when you do it of your own prompting, you have an angle. Well, maybe if I'm nice enough, they'll stop doing what they're doing. That's no good. See, that's how you know when you're doing it. When you're doing it, you're trying to make something happen. In every single case, we do things to try and make an outcome come forth that we want. When you operate by the voice of the Lord, there is no outcome you want. You simply, simply operate in love. You see the difference. When you responded to that person, you didn't want a thing. You simply purposed within yourself that you were going to love that person in that moment and help that person. You didn't want anything in return. You were not trying to make anything happen. That's how you know that was the voice of the Lord. When we do it ourselves, we're always trying to cause an outcome. Always. Well, I'm going to be nice to this person and hopefully they'll do this. Well, I'm going to do this so they do this. There's always what they used to call an angle, right? Always an angle. Stephen had no angle. Because when you operate by the spirit of truth, there is no angle. There is nothing you want in return. It's all servitude. It's all love. Hopefully you guys caught that. When we do something, there's an angle to the outcome. When you operate by the voice of the Lord, there's only purpose. And it's rooted in absolute love that can never be discouraged. That means you're not looking for reward. You're not looking for any of that stuff. You're not thinking about safety. You're not thinking about all that stuff. That's how you know it's his voice. When we do it, we do it to try and extract or, or, or make a certain outcome manifest. The Lord does not forget. He said, vengeance is mine. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He told us not to touch it. Do not seek vengeance. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It is the human appetite that wants to see people pay for their crimes. That's when we have, when, when somebody hurts someone you love, you want them to pay for something. We often forget about Christ in those moments. We often forget that nobody gets away with anything. That's why it's important for us to be sober, right? Those of us. Now, everybody does not have your walk and everybody's not going to do that. You know that, don't you? They're not. God called you to a higher standard. He called you to a much higher standard. See, people of the world are going to sue each other to pieces, but he called you to a higher standard. He even took disciples of the world who were doing things in the world, and he called them to a higher standard from every walk of life. He did. But he did not call everybody, did he, to be a disciple? He didn't. Everybody was not accepted to be a disciple because everybody could not do that. You know what that means? That means if you said, if you responded to the call of Christ, you're among the few. Thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, it's rare. Look at the world. Look at the world. Look how the world operates and the people in the world and imagine something. You've been called out of that to a higher standard. It's real for you. It's real. You've been called out of that to a higher standard. That's why many of you, you're trying to resolve things by the world's ways. Utilizing holy things and it doesn't work out too well. And sometimes we get confused because the Lord is doing a work in you that is absolutely real. Also in the Bible it says that your life, because you're called, you responded to the call, that in your life, somebody is going to glorify Christ because of you. Now how wonderful is that? What greater thing could you do for the Lord in this earth than to actually bring him glory? In truth, your life is going to bring that out. This scripture we're reading in Revelation 8 is that the Lord has never shifted from the vengeance he'll have upon darkness. Not upon you, upon darkness. Do you hear me? He is a just God. He already declared 
his vengeance upon the world and gave us prophecies about it. He has his timing for it. And when you see here these trumpets, and he says the prayers of the saints ascended up before God in the angel's hand, and the angel took that censer filled with the fire in the altar and cast it to the earth. Oh, that's the vengeance about to work. So that's why you expect everything shifts at this point, because the Lord's vengeance is part of this. Now that means prior to this time, nothing was cast into the earth as part of vengeance, because the sixth seal is part of a process. It's a process. In fact, it's something that the ancients talked about too. I want you to remember something of the ancients. Went through that time of the flood, the ancients went through that time of the exodus. When it was absolute carnage on the earth, they tried to record everything they saw. But the Bible gives us a context of what the Father was doing with these elements. They interpret things based on what they believed at the time. And they did not believe in Yahshua HaMashiach for the most part. The Egyptians did not believe in Christ. And so what they did was they recorded the events and the destroyer and everything else, but they had no belief in Christ. So they utilized the knowledge they had at the time to interpret what they were seeing in the heavens and what they lived through on the earth. But there's something funny. Pharaoh, the same one who held God's people, that Pharaoh, do you know, the, you know what happened after the destroyer passed to that line of Pharaohs? You know they were disbanded after that, right? But listen, one of them said that the God of Moses was the absolute God. And as his face, they said his face was known to all men in the sky, though men did not know exactly who it was. His face passed in the sky and it would come again. Everybody who was in the time of the destroyer had this deep set belief it was coming again and immediately wanted to have their children prepared. In fact, it was them that said forsake earthly goods and save the soul. Do you know that same thing was echoed here in America? Forsake earthly goods and save the soul. And do you know that Jesus spoke about the same thing when he said, don't go back to take anything out of your houses, separating yourself from materialistic things. The Egyptians documented the same thing other cultures did around them, but without that centric belief in Christ or the living God. Although one of the pharaohs absolutely believed went out to the desert until they died. But they sought a life of peace. It was so devastating. It forced this difference in mankind. From being people hungry with power like they are today. To people who only wanted peace. Accepting their fates. Accepting conditions. Only wanting peace. The only one of peace. And it's coming around again. In fact it was told to Daniel. To seal up that book. Make sure. That book carries on. God will unseal it in the end of days, which is why we're having a greater understanding of the book of Daniel today. Those before us could not understand Daniel very well. They couldn't. And here we are again. The marker of the destroyer in Egypt, in the Americas, back during that time in the Americas, in other regions, it was this. The people lost faith in their governments. That is amazing. I have to take my hat off on that one. Because every time, look, when I first was introduced into the true history, the, these, seeing these things with my own eyes. I was astounded that they all went through the same thing. The processes were the same. They said women were like men and men were like women. They would wear each other's clothes. That's how it began. Relationships would begin. And then they said children would be born who were men. They would be men, but they would look just like a woman. And women would start to be born. They were women, but they would look just like men. At that same time, people would rebel against their governments. After they rebelled, they lost all faith in their governments and sought to punish the leaders. These are steps documented, the same thing that's in the Bible. But these were documented outside of the Word of God. These are from people who witnessed or went through that time of the destroyer. And they documented everything before it and everything after. And it lines up with the word of God beautifully. After they rebelled against the leaders, they hung some of them. They did. They hung them. A time of persecution of all the leaders. And it began and it said men would be troubled, but they didn't know what they would be troubled with. We're talking about if we did this collectively. With all the books that I know of, they're saying the exact same thing. They're saying during the time, listen, one other thing was men would travel in the sea. In iron fish, men would fly in the air like they would ride a horse or something like that. I forgot the exact 
phraseology, but it was something like that. So it was talking about aircraft. The conditions that would surround the arrival of the destroyer. It also said that one man would speak to another man in a different land through a speaking stone. It said that. You know where that came from? Because we're hitting all nations here. And all of them say the exact same thing. When it was talking about one man speaking to another man on a different land through a speaking stone, do you know where that came from? Can't say too much. But these all dealt with civilizations that witnessed the destroyer. Here's a line for you. The four mighty men who expelled the Nephilim will hold back both fires and winds that nothing stir upon the earth, nor day or night, something, something else, till the designated tribes of the earth take flight. You'd be shocked where that came from. That's an actual, uh, that's an actual statement. Somebody says the Hopis. No, it wasn't from the Hopis. They have what they said was that there would be some great shakings. I know the Hopi thing very, very well, but there would be some great shakings. Right, and they they do have some interpretations that they they have not released to anybody yet. Nobody has certain sayings they had. They also have the stone. They have a very special stone from a figure, Kahana. They have a stone that matches four other stones. You guys know they had an encounter with Christ. The Hopi did. See, because the Hopi had the initial things that were written a thousand years ago, and then they had an encounter during the time of Christ with a figure they had never seen before, but that they trusted. A certain set of elders kept that knowledge, but they also taught the knowledge. They taught the name. They also talked about the arrival of this figure again and gave everything around it. See, not every all this internet Hopi stuff, it doesn't have that in there because they will not speak it yet. During the time when certain signs are shown, they will openly speak of it, but until that time comes, they won't. And keep, keep in mind, it was the Hopi that told the United Nations when the world wars would start. It was them who told them about the trains that would be running through this nation before the trains were running through this nation. It was them who kept going back to the United Nations to plead with them. They even warned them before they even thought about some moon missions. They told them about bringing back the rock from the moon. It would cause an imbalance because everything was in balance. They already told them about that. They told them a bunch of things, and not one of them failed. Not one of them failed. So you have these different beliefs all around the world. My point is this. All of them were witnesses of the destroyer, and they say the exact same things. For example, a description of the destroyer means it's not some planet that sits there. No, no. No. The government, the government went and they pay archaeologists. You guys know that. They have a Congress and actual govern. They govern what archaeologists can publish and what they can't. And any paid archaeologist, because they, they work doing research, but they get paid by the government, they will always tell you that if it does not align itself with Darwin's theory, they can't publish it. And nobody is bold enough to end their careers by publishing something that they think is truth that does not complement their theory of evolution, Darwin's theory of evolution. But they found some things, and they deciphered some things from many different lands, and they all say the same thing. When the destroyer was right next to the earth, listen to me, something was right next to the earth they could see down its throat. That's how it was described. They said in the center was a blackness they had never beheld. And out of that blackness came red tongues that would touch the surface of the earth, right? Breath would come from the destroyer that they could physically see filling up the sky with clouds. Red cloud, red and purple clouds, which was poisonous to mankind. They saw mountain formations form within minutes and other mountain formations decline within minutes. It moved everything on the surface of the earth. And they also said that around the destroyer, it had helpers. It blotted out the moon. See, that part was just fascinating to me. This thing blotted out the moon. And it blotted out a big portion of the day. And it took over the sky, a big portion of it at night. That sounds familiar. That sounds so familiar, doesn't it? So they were seeing something that we're also about to see. They also said this was the sixth pass of the destroyer. The ancient records, the ones that they said were ancient. Can you imagine the people back during the time of the flood looking at ancient records? And the ones in the times of Moses looking at ancient records. And they said men had long forgotten 
the long durational seasons. They don't know them. That's why I often use that example. What would happen if human beings were born? If we were born in November and we died in February and somebody started talking about summer, we'd say they were crazy because we did not live in those times. We have no witness of those times and where we have no witness, we just simply don't believe it. Though when the season of winter begins to break, none of us would understand it. But we're just like that. We were born in a set of generations disconnected from that disaster. One of the major things to destroy when it came around was people were burning with a desire to make sure that their children know what, how they got to that stage in the first place. And so they said, after many generations, societies would mature. They would work with metal again. I mean, they laid everything out. Everything was laid out. We'd work with metal. We'd create toys. Entertainment would rule the day. Men would become like pigs, it said, like slobs. In other words, people wouldn't really work. They'd sit on their butts and do everything they could do. Right? They would lose their natural ability to live in, with nature. People would fight over nature, over the health of nature, I believe it says. Right? It also said that the sanctity of marriage would be dropped and nobody would discuss marriage. Everybody would date. They talked about some of the new policies or homosexuality coming out. They talked about that. They talked about the corruptness of churches and everything else. They talked about that. Religions. In fact, it said that one religion would pass through the earth. That, that, that it would be soothsayers during that time. A soothsayer is science. When people believe in these facts and everything is based off facts. Right? What you can prove, this, that, and the other. So they certainly saw the progressive states and the growth of humanity. And we're back on track again. Now this time, they said, would be the last time. There is no time after this. There's no other season of the destroyer after this. And so we have to face the fullness of the destroyer, which they cried for. Because somehow they knew it. They knew that the time that was up and coming would be the last time. They knew it. They knew that this time would be with the Messiah. And, and they even talked about the Messiah, how the Messiah would not be recognized as being the Messiah. That men would fight over belief and that a great war would ensue over the black nectar. As with, you know what the black nectar is? That's oil. They called it nectar because nectar is an important food. A very If, if you're in the wild and you get bee honey, you're supercharged within seconds and that's why they called it the food of the gods back then right but they said that they would fight over the black nectar and that the middle east or in in, in the hopi's case those who had the first light of wisdom uh in the middle east is where this would be but they also said this after the shakings a cry would go forth a cry that even the heavens would hear from the earth from men's kingdoms a cry that was never heard before or will be again. See, even they were talking about the first and the last of an episode so terrible that would never, ever happen again. Even they talked about that. We're in that time. According to them, we're in that time. According to the word of God, we're in that time. Why? Because the Messiah has come. Now, before I knew any of that, I can't even deny the dreams that I've had. I can't move away from them. That's what was given to me. These were not normal dreams either. The one thing I did not tell you guys is this. When I had those dreams, I wasn't laying down. Who has a dream not laying down? And so don't ask me, you know, the, the greater detail. All I know is that in, in a literal sense, I was taken somewhere. And I saw things. And I cannot deny what I was shown. And it happened before. Before the word was rooted in me before and i don't know what you call it because people have said well mike was it a dream or vision i just called it a dream i cannot tell you what it was i have no recollection as to how i went into it all i know was coming out of it how different i felt every single time and i had it 24 times it's almost like it would not go away until i was absolutely used to it and that's exactly what happened by the 24th time i was so used to things happening they were not a surprise but through those dreams the lord prepared me for every single situation global situation i've been through he prepared me for that without those dreams i'm gonna call them dreams or visions whatever you want to call them, i would not be prepared and that's how the lord prepares me but what's coming for example fire from below the earth 
and above the earth will happen in Texas. The splitting of the Appalachian Mountains, the people cut off, and the sheer terror of the creepers or the ones that walk in softly and slowly, right? These lights that you guys see, the misnamed objects, this and the other. People are trying to define them as something they want to understand, forgetting that these things have the power to manifest as anything. They can be something out of your wildest dreams or your worst nightmares. But they need your loyalty because you're the ones with authority. They want everyone to give over their authority to the one who will come through the door. And that will be the Antichrist. He'll have no regard of a woman. Do you know upon listening to that, that the Antichrist will have no regard of a woman? I thought one time, just not twice, but one time. Could that mean that this Antichrist is a female? But that was it. That was all. But the Antichrist is vengeful. Then we get to the trumpets. Guys, let's go back to the trumpets. And in the trumpets, you see the prayers of the saint thrown into the earth. I'm, I'm telling you what, what I saw, what I was exposed to, what I actually saw was people in such distress, bad distress. And when you know it, even this last week was confirmation of yet another marker. And I hope that people are going to take advantage of every single day to do the right thing. Let me read this, guys, real quick, because I'm running out of time here. Let me speed this up. So he says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seventh angel, which had the seven trumpets, prepared the sound, prepared themselves to sound. So in truth, the seventh seal marks the blowing of the seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets are not good. The seven trumpets are like declarations, warnings of what God is going to do to the earth. A trumpet historically is blown as part of an announcement. It's for the trumpets. An announcement. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, it says. And when you know in the book of Daniel and in the book of Joel and in Amos, these events, you can pick out the sequential markers of these events by having all those books laid out before you and you can see these events in there sequentially not failing in their sequential order now know that a lot of people don't believe revelation is in order but i don't see it out of order what i do see is a pattern revelation will tell you what god declared then it goes into the history the detailed history of specific things and it goes back to the declarations and then it goes into a history then it goes back to the declarations so you have the six seals. I can see those happening in sequential order. The seventh seal, right? Even with the even with the um, uh, sixth seal, people are going to survive that. They're going to continue to live. But then you get to the seventh seal, and there's silence. And the angels, the, the angels that are given the trumpets, prepared to sound. But that's when the fire from the altar with the prayers of the saints is cast into the earth. And when you know it, the trumpets are beginning to sound. And the first angel sounded. And there followed hail, fire, mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And a third part of the trees were burnt up and all the green grass was burnt up. Right? So we're having an actual physical effect by way of the trumpets, which are declarations. As to what God said he would do in the book of Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Daniel, Amos, all those books stated exactly what God would do. And so here we are. Now follow me on this. And then it says the second the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. So here we have again a trumpet, a physical reaction of the earth. I can see this happening sequentially. I really can see this happening sequentially. I remember one time I was talking to a, me and me, BP and Earth Watch and I were talking and he suggested it seems like all of this is happening from one major event and I, you know I could easily concur with that I could easily concur with that that's good sound logic but in this case it is good to know that these trumpets are declaring something to the earth but it is not the end of it now this first trumpet which burns up the trees, right? The, a big portion of the trees and all the green grass was burnt up. Human life is going to be just like it states it's going to be. In the book of Isaiah, it tells us about this. In Jeremiah, it tells us about this. Ezekiel tells us about this. Joel tells us about this. 
Daniel tells us about this. Amos tells us about this. This same thing. So I can absolutely see it happening in this sequential order. Some people believe it's out of order. Everybody is fine to believe what they want to, but listen, I have to stay true to what the Lord has given me. I'm no good at adopting somebody else's views as my own and then retelling it. I, don't, I can't do that. I have to give you what the Lord gave me or that would be disingenuous. So a third part of the creatures which were in the sea that had life died and a third part of the ships were destroyed. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. I'm sorry. And a third angel sounded there fell a great star from heaven burning as it were a lamp and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. First of all, it said nothing about landfall. So it's emphasizing falling upon the land and the waters. And again, we talked about these big ice chunks in space that if they were to ever explode in the atmosphere they would cause fallout see most of that most of the ice chunks up there are made of arsenic and if that were to have some sort of aerial burst that would absolutely cause arsenic to go into the waters of earth it would absolutely change the color also wouldn't it so we would have this fulfillment and according to those days in the past it is it when blood drops to the earth the destroyer the destroyer is here so in every single case in all these ancient cultures they warned us about blood dropping to the earth now they said blood dropping to the earth they probably didn't have a name for it at that moment but it's the same event it's the same thing it's the same object with the same cause and effect is it you guys remember Sri Lanka when that uh, the blood that was raining the it was raining blood and and they looked inside that blood and it was blood cells actual cells the actual blood cells without a nuclei they already looked at that what they did not tell you is right before that blood rain started there were four meteor impacts they didn't tell you that did they four meteor impacts four so it's funny how four meteor impacts happened and then that blood rain came can you imagine if something hit the land and it began to melt after it melts, where is it going to go? If you guys can see that. So let, let, let me see. And a third angel sounded, and there fell a great star burning from heaven, uh, 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 from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. Revelation 8, 11. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and a third part of the waters became Wormwood. See, it's emphasizing the waters, just like in the days of old when people could not drink the waters. And in fact, they said that a lot of the waters were gone, but the waters that were left were poisonous. And if you drank those waters, you would die. And that was back during the time of the destroyer. Isn't that something, how they are so unique? But it's for this study, I want to tell you guys something that... Do you see how this wormwood, this bitterness, only affects the waters? There is no declaration about the land. So here's what we have so far. The first trumpet blows and all the green grass is burnt up. All the green grass and a third part of the trees are gone. So the earth has no grass. It's all burnt up and a third part of the trees are gone. And then all of a sudden, as it were, a, a, a mountain, burning mountain is cast into the sea. And it does damage to the sea. So now you have a third part of the tree is gone. All the green grass is burnt up. And the sea is contaminated with many ships destroyed. And then all of a sudden you have a meteorite that comes from, or, or some big object coming from space. I would say it explodes in the atmosphere. That's what I would say. I would say it's a big ice chunk that's quite large. And, it, and by the way, those are in the asteroid belt, lots of them. But it explodes in the atmosphere and it settles upon the waters. Arsenic. Most of the objects out there that are comprised of ice. They're high in arsenic, and if they were to have an aerial burst, it would devastate the surface of the planet. So we would have no tree, hardly any trees, burnt up grass, the sea is no good, the ship, many ships are destroyed, right? The ocean's dying, and all of a sudden now we have arsenic on top of that. And many people who are drinking the water, they die because the waters are made bitter. They don't die from the impact. They die because the waters are bitter. I think this is an aerial burst. I don't think that wormwood actually hits the ground. I think it explodes in the air. I do. And it, I'm, I more than believe it's a big cluster of objects. When you see a cluster of objects coming into the atmosphere, they travel as one. So they're going to light up brilliantly. 
just like one object until they hit the atmosphere and then they're going to disperse in every single direction well most of them by way of inertia going into the uh, uh, trajectory line of, of, of its approach but you guys see where I'm going with this there's an aerial explosion of that ice which disperses all over the waters so you have gases, you have fog and everything else in the clouds, but it's an arsenic fog. And then it touches everything. So wormwood does not do anything to the land. It does everything to the water. The, the, in the beginning, the very first trumpet has an impact to the land. But then after that, there's an impact to the oceans by this, as it were, great mountain that was tossed into the sea. And then you have wormwood, which comes a cluster of ice balls with an aerial explosion. Their composition is arsenic. It explodes, and that arsenic disperses all over the face of wherever it lands, which is probably half or three-quarters of the Earth. The waters are made bitter. And if that were to happen, you could not drink the waters. Not full of arsenic, you would die. You would die. About a, about a day after drinking that water, you'd be dead. We all know arsenic can kill you. We And, and we also know that those ice balls in space have high levels of arsenic. This was written a long time ago, right? Boy, they really got it right. Even in the sequential events happening, they got it right. That's why I mapped this out, so that you guys can see it. I did. You have a lot of people these days who chart things out based on theory, but what if somebody charted this out based on the Word of God and nothing else? Like it says, Wormwood, it talks about the waters and not the land, so we'll keep it like that. It'll, it'll mess up the waters and not the land. In order for that to happen, we know what that has to be. What about a great mountain burning, as it were, with fire was cast into the sea? Well, what is that? Then we go to, when it's talking about, after it talks about wormwood, it says, and the fourth, this is the one, and the fourth angel sounded, and a third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars, so a third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it in the night likewise. Something is blocking the sun and the moon. And then it says, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. So let's stop right there. So you have trouble in the earth, yes, but it doesn't destroy the earth. No, it causes the situations on earth to be very challenging, desperate for a lot of people, but there's still people on the earth. But now the woes come. The woes did not come before this. Now the woes are coming. I don't know about you, but the woes are quite heavy, right? I can absolutely see this unfolding sequentially. Absolutely.